word from MSU. That's what that's, that's make stuff. That's make stuff up. So um, no, I'm just kidding. I really don't. Well, I probably do. So I know Gage wanted me to go through LIS and Medicaid with you guys today. Um, I've got a couple of other PowerPoints that I can show. Uh, Gage, I don't want to steal your thunder, man. I see you on here. I'll let you kind of chime in and tell me what you uh, what all you'd like me to cover. I can devote all the resources that you need. So really, John, I would just like you to uh, obviously elaborate on LIS and really touch base on what you just mentioned about being able to help people that may not even be our Medicare clients, but be able to help them enroll into the Medicare.gov and, and to register into the SSA.gov because what you just provided to people is something that number one, a lot of them don't even know about, but number two, you provided something to them that they didn't ask for that could really benefit them. So what, where that goes with clients is you're actually really trying to help them. You're not trying to sell them just a life policy or you're not just trying to write them you know, a Medicare uh, plan. You're honestly trying to help them to the best of your ability and that's really where I want this to go today, John, is just elaborating on these extra little pieces of information that will be very, very valuable to these people um, and helping us kind of navigate on how to do that for our clients moving forward. No worries, man. I got you. Um, okay, so do I, I do. I'll cover several things. So what you guys see here is um, all the training that I've created for Heartland. As you can see, it's pretty robust. Um, if you're really unfamiliar with Part C and Engage, if you just tell me which ones you want, I can start to send them. Um, but just a word uh, of caution is that it's all quite robust. When most people when most people do a slide, there's just a few bullets. That's not enough information for you to really understand in my own personal opinion and being in the Medicare market for 20 plus years. Um, it's just not enough information. So a lot of the training, if you don't see a lot of content that's actually on the slides, guys, it's down in the note section. And as you can see, it's very, very detailed, but it will give you, will you remember all of this? No, but I'll just give you, um, a little bit of warning. It's everything and anything you would ever want or need to know. You will know more than probably 96% of the people that are in the marketplace, all the way up to and including how to generate an SCP, which ones are the best ones or the most commonly used, uh, and actually how to apply those SCPs. So you can generate opportunity for yourself where there is currently none. So what I'm going to do today, though, is I'm going to spend a little time and we're going to go through one that I think a few of you were able to jump on last week that I was doing for um, Tyler on the Medicare Tuesday. Everybody can see this. It says understanding Medicaid and LIS. Yes. That's good. Okay. Yes. okay. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, you'll you'll find that my training is quite interactive because I, I do feed off of your questions and that helps us go down maybe other roads of things that uh, you might run into. So this is going to be a very high level overview for you on Medicaid and LIS. And then, um, as Gage stated, it'll start to talk about how to create some opportunities. But you got to know the ba the basics first for your foundation. So the first thing to realize is, is that just like Medicare is not just for old people and, and actually, you know, seniors is a, is a uh, prohibited statement on Medicare. It's Medicare beneficiaries because it can be for anyone. Um, you know, I have sold uh, a Medicare Part C plan to a blind and deaf two-year-old uh, that was in a low-income house that was completely disabled. So think about that. Not only did I sell them a Medicaid plan, but they had full Medicare uh, due to their disability of, of being a blind and deaf child. So Always look and ask questions and try to determine uh, if there's opportunity for you, just like what I was telling David about his mother-in-law, is that there's opportunity there. Um, the first thing is to be able to recognize what that opportunity is. 
So the first thing to understand is that Medicaid, even by its broadest, loosest definition, is really not just for poor people. Assets or income is only one test uh, that a state uses in order to see if that person would qualify for additional assistance. Those individuals are known as LIR, or low income resources. They're going to look at things like their home. They're going to look at things like their retirement accounts, if they have any stocks, bonds, annuities, life insurance in excess of $2,500 uh, in cash value, um, if they have any rental property that they're deriving any of their income from. All of those things combined are going to determine whether that person crosses what's called the resource threshold uh, for the state Medicaid system. Now, in order to get Medicaid, uh, you're, you're supposed to be a U.S. citizen or lawfully admitted since this is from state taxpayer dollars. There are some states who are trying to expand that to people who are not here legally uh, through our immigration. So that's a whole other topic of debate. But again, it can vary from state to state. So remember, age, income is not the only qualifier for someone on Medicaid. Now, there are state-only programs where they may have expanded those programs. For example, they have state-only programs, which is not considered Medicaid. If any of you live in like, um, I don't know, Illinois, or I'm sorry, uh, New York or Pennsylvania, for example, Pennsylvania has a program that's called the PACE program, which is a state pharmacy assistance program. In um, New York, they have the EPIC program, which they can make $100,000 a year with no asset test to qualify for extra assistance on their Part D. Even though those help, those are not considered Medicaid and are considered state-only programs. So when you go around and you look at the map, you can see the map that shows 37 states have actually expanded their Medicaid benefits. Uh, Missouri and Oklahoma said they're, they're going to expand it. And then all the gold states are saying that they're not going to expand it. And what that does is, um, it actually allowed more flexibility, less look back time, uh, higher income and threshold limits for people to actually qualify for this for uh, Medicaid benefits. This is called the FPL or the Federal Poverty Limit. This should be your guide. Like if you were to go to Google right now and you were to type in uh, 2022 Federal Poverty Limit Guide, it's gonna give you a long grid. It's not gonna look like this. What I've done is I've taken the FPL limits and I've actually made it where it's geared specifically toward Medicare Advantage essentially and what the qualifying levels are. So for example, and we're gonna cover all these guys, so don't worry about writing this down and you can have this PowerPoint. So a Quimby, which is a qualified Medicare beneficiary, which is what most people think about when they think about the, med the, the levels of Medicaid because it covers everything. They have to be 100% of the federal poverty limit or less. As you can see here, as an example, a family size of one, they can't make more than $13,590 as of 2022 per year or about $1,133 uh, in monthly income. And David, I hate to use you as an example, but if I remember correctly, you said that um, your mother-in-law was around $1,200. So if you would look, what that's going to do is that's really going to knock her up into this level, which is a SLIMBY status, which is the next one, which is a specified low-income Medicare beneficiary. This doesn't provide medical benefits, but only provides uh, financial benefit of their Part B. Then you have the last one, which is a QI, which is a qualified individual. That's 120 to 135 percent of the FPL. So to make your life and your job easier, this is a quick reference sheet that you can begin to look at for Medicaid status. The Medicaid status, again, works by the family size. So you just add additional money for every person. So if there's a family of two, they file jointly. They can't make more than 18,310 in a year or 1,526 uh, per month to get the highest level of Medicaid as it's based on the FPL level. Uh, this is a good quick, cheat sheet for you to look at that as you're conducting your phone calls uh, and you're doing some of this outreach and you're starting to talk about doing some Medicare reviews, have this grid up or have it minimized at least so you can pull it up real quick. And as you're talking about final expense, for example, and they're throwing out what their budget is or you hit them with, uh, you hit them with a monthly premium and say, oh no, I can't afford that because you know, I only make $1,100 a month or I make you know, 
three hundred and seventy six dollars uh, a, a week. Some people make that. Some people only draw six to eight hundred dollars a month. So then you'll be able to look at this very quickly and say, OK, if they're not getting help right now, I know I could help them with that. And that's going to help you start to funnel or streamline your conversation toward a specific benefit, toward a specific product with specific levels. I have a question, yeah. uh, not just for my mother-in-law, but for my mom as well. Both of them are on disability and both of them went years without getting the uh, payment of their disability and then got their back pay. So like my mother-in-law, an example, she went six years without collecting disability. Now all of a sudden she just had like a $70,000 check come in, you know, so is because she got so much back pay, is that going to disqualify her for being in the poverty level? Yes. Because what that'll do when they retroactive back pay on on disability payments because uh, their need was actually or their disability was greater than what was originally assessed by uh, SSI and Social Security, what they'll do is that's cash. So essentially, she got a check and or she got a direct deposit for that entire amount. Um, that money is sitting in cash, so that does actually uh, count as uh, resources for the allocation of the benefits. The other thing that they can't do is they can't start to do what's called um, transfers because there is a 60 month look back on Medicaid to look at people's assets and income to see how they actually transferred out property or real benefits or, or monies. Uh, and if they find that they improperly transferred those benefits for the sheer purpose of qualifying for additional benefits, they can actually lose the opportunity, David, to um, receive those benefits for the remainder of their life if, if they discover that that type of look back uh, did occur. So what she'll need to do is she'll need to spend that money or speak with her caseworker at the, at the state. Uh, and they may make them work because it is back pay. They may make them uh, work through what's called a Medicaid spend down, which means they have to spend X amount of those dollars every year toward um, med or every month toward a medical benefit. And once they exceed that threshold, their Medicaid could then kick in. She that just could bought a, a home and a car out, right? And she did spend vast majority of that money. Mm, I would speak with the caseworker and let them really take a look at it because without me seeing some of the, the due diligence portion of it, it'd be hard for me to answer that. But typically, yes, they do count that because it's income. Okay. Just like if you were to just like when people are on Medicaid, guys, and for example, if the beneficiary, <coughs> excuse me, is on Medicaid and they get the death benefit, it'll knock them out of their Medicaid status as well. I've seen it happen. It's no different. Any other questions before I move on? A uh, really quick number of persons and household, that would be just what they're um, putting on their taxes, right? Like it wouldn't just, if they're yeah, not married. Yeah, it's gonna be while I take care of my grandbabies. They, they, it has to be what's filed on their adjusted grossing or their income uh, filing. And it's also based on their AGI, their adjusted gross income. Okay, thank you. I figured, but I just want to check. Yeah, so it can't be like just a caregiver. They actually, they have to physically be financially responsible for that individual and where no one else can claim any um, earned tax credit or anything else on them. So there are actually seven levels to Medicaid. We're going to focus on just a couple to help demystify it. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a QMB or a QMB status. That's a qualified Medicare beneficiary. As you can see, there's another one with a plus. We'll go through those differences. There's a SLIMB or a specified low income Medicare beneficiary, a QI known as a qualified individual, qualified disabled and working individual, meaning they're not fully disabled. Uh, however, they're still able to work either in a sitting position or uh, in a limited amount of time. Then there's also the FBDE, which is a full benefit dual eligible. This is a quick graph that'll show you what the actual benefits are for each one of those people broken down really, really easy for you. So as I said earlier, the Quimby status or the qualified Medicare beneficiary, that's what most people think about when they think about someone who's on Medicaid, you know, not to be derogatory in any way. So please, I hope no one takes offense to this, but what Medicaid and Quimby status used to be known as is the poor man's med sub because it worked just like a plan F because it covers everything. Um, if they didn't work the 40 quarters that's allocated or that's required by social security in order to receive Medicare part A for free, it'll actually pay that premium for them. 
which can be up to you know four hundred and seventy one dollars uh, a month for Part A if you didn't work uh, at least thirty or at least twenty nine quarters uh, to get into that thirty quarter mark. Also, it includes all of the Part B monthly premium, no matter what it goes up to each and every year. As you can see, it does not include the Part uh, the Part D monthly premium. The reason is is because if I qualify for any of these levels, any level of Medicaid, I'm always uh, considered 100% LIS or low income subsidy. Medicaid does not help with the prescription drug component uh, for the premium. That's LIS or low income subsidy, which we'll cover at the end of this presentation. Uh, Q Quimby status also gets all their Medicare deductibles, their co-payments and their co-insurance covered. So that would be the part A deductible, the part B deductible, the 20% co-insurance, this with Part B, and also the inpatient hospitalization and any Part A uh, insurance uh, that they would have to pay for the covered services. SLIMBY status is next, or Specified Low-Income Medicare Beneficiary. If there's SLIMBY only, as you can see, it does not include coverage for their Part A. It does, include, it does include payment for their Medicare Part B. Also, it does not include their Part D. It does not include their Medicare deductibles. That's why I said earlier, it's financial assistance only, no medical. If they're kind of in between a Slimby and a Quimby based on the state, they may be awarded what's called a Slimby Plus. Slimby uh, Plus, which is essentially, David, what I was saying um, about a Medicaid spend down, essentially. That would fall under a Slimby Plus uh, typically, because as you can see, those benefits would vary by state. The rules to qualify for it vary by state as well. But it really acts just like a Slimby only, but it can include additional coverage for these Medicare deductibles and copayments. A QI, which is known as a qualified individual. They are just like a Slimby, as you can see, the only difference is, is they receive a portion of their Part B. It may be all, it may not be all. The other thing to, the other thing to realize is, is this is a state uh, benefit that's from, or it's actually a federal benefit, but it's funded by the state that it's in. And there's a limited amount of resources or money available for this individual. Even if someone qualifies, for this level of assistance, and there's no more money at the state to pay for it, they will not be enrolled. Every year they have to reapply with priority given to those who had it the previous year. Let's demystify that a little more. So as I said earlier, a Quimby or a qualified Medicare beneficiary, as you can see, I give you how to pronounce it, it's pronounced Quimby. That individual must have a monthly income limit of no more as an individual of $1,133 or 1,526 if they're married. They can't, they can't exceed $8,400 in individual resources or $12,600 if they're married. As you can see, that's not a lot of money. By any stretch of the imagination, if you were to use our quality of, of standards in this country, not necessarily uh, internationally, but in this country, that person would be considered impoverished. That's very little money to try to live on, pay doctor bills, pay for food, pay for everything else, especially with the hyperinflation that's currently uh, going on within our economy. You can again see that it pays the Part A premiums, the Part B premiums, all deductibles, all co-insurance, and all co-payments. Here's the easiest way, guys, to determine what level that individual is currently on. Without going through all the things I just went through, the easiest way to begin to determine if that person is Medicaid and at the Quimby, at the Quimby, or Quimby plus status. Could you mute your phones? Thank you. The easiest way to tell is to ask a very simple question. How much do you currently pay for your prescription medications? If they tell you that they pay $1.35 for generic, more importantly, $4 for brand, 
There is not a Part B plan out there that has $4 for brand medication. More importantly, there is no other level of assistance other than this level of Medicaid that would have this type of drug copay. It can get a little confusing on that $1.35 for generic because if you turn around, depending on what they take, um, and if you look at some of the Part D plans that are out there, depending on if it's a widely prescribed generic medication, it may be listed as a $0 copay. So that'll throw you off. That's why your very next question is, does that include brand, uh, brand name medication, Ms. Jones? Are you taking any of those? Yes, baby, I'm taking a few. Well, you don't mind me asking, Ms. Jones, how much are you currently paying for those? Oh, I pay about $4. Your mind should automatically say they're a Quimby, either a Quimby or a Quimby Plus, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then what you're immediately going to look at is, is a DSNP product for that market. DSNP, dual eligible special need plans. Make sure that you're currently appointed uh, for a product in that market. If there's an additional certification, like for example, with United Healthcare, which there is, make sure that you are DSNP certified so you don't write a, a, bit, a plan outside of what your certification would allow you to. But that's where you're going to audit. There is no other question. That's the only plan you're going to show them. Any other plan in that market that is a DSNP, if they pay these for their medications. Here's another interesting thing. David brought up another interesting uh, fact, which is that um, for six years, one of the individuals he was speaking with did not get their full disability. Now, the way disability works is it does take, um, it's a 24 month wait, five additional months, which is 29. Then on the 30th month, they'll get their Medicare. A lot of times when people are aging into their Medicare or they get their Medicare that way and they haven't worked enough quarters, a lot of those individuals may in fact, when you look at their Medicare card, it may in fact say Part B only. There's opportunity there too. What you've got to do is you got to, even if they didn't work all of their quarters, they can still get Medicare Part A, which of course you have to have Part A. A, you have to have Part B if you're going to market a Medicare supplement and or Medicare Advantage Part C to them. If someone is paying this level for their drug plan and they have a Part B only Medicare card and they're a Quimby status, you do not have to wait for the GEP, which is the general enrollment period to enroll them into a plan into Medicare Part A which would then start on July 1, because that runs from March 1, I'm sorry, from January 1 to March 31st, and then they get a July 1 effective date. If they're Medicaid under the Quimby status, you can actually call Social Security, and a lot of times they can be placed into Medicare Part A, and then Medicaid will actually pay any premium that may be associated with their Part A. Again, notice, Quimby does what? Part A premium is actually paid, even if they did not work enough quarters, 40 quarters to get Part A for free at no charge, Medicaid will actually pay that if they're Quimby status and they have Part A only, you can generate an enrollment from this by calling Social Security and having them enroll in Part A. Social Security ultimately makes up the determination whether it can be immediate or they have to wait till July 1, but it's always uh, best practice is if you go ahead and help that person qualify because either it'll be an enrollment today or it'll be an enrollment that you get to stack on to the future. The choice is actually up to you and what uh, the level of determination is. The next one is a SLIMBY or a specified low income Medicare beneficiary. Again, remember this is financial assistance only. It does not include uh, any medical benefits unless they're a SLIMBY plus, which does vary by state. They can't make more than $1,359 in monthly income. If they're married, $1,831. As you can see, the FPL levels are the same, $8,400 and $12,006. As a note, SLIMBY helps pay for Part B premiums only. Just like there was with Quimby, where there's a quick thing, you ask the same question, guys. How much do you currently pay for your prescription medications? When you ask that, if they tell you $395 for generic and $985 for brand, Ms. Jones, if you don't mind me asking, how much are you currently paying for your prescription medications? 
Oh, baby, I'm paying about $10. Is that generic or is that name brand? Oh, no, that's name brand medication. You automatically know that person is either a Slimby, a QI, or full LIS. Slimby, QI, or full LIS. That's all you really need to know. That's automatically going to determine what kind of plan do I put them in. I either put them in a zero plan premium product or one with a low monthly plan premium using the other thing I just talked to David about, which was LIS premium reduction coordination. When you see a lot of BMA plans that are out there, it may have a, a $10, a $9, a $19 premium. I can guarantee you that if not all of, the vast majority of that monthly premium that's associated with that MA plan is the drug plan. Again, remember, what does LIS or low income subsidy help with? Doesn't help with Medicaid because it's not Medicaid. It doesn't help with medical. All it actually helps with is their Part D. So if the premium that's associated on the plan is associated with Part D, if I have LIS, which helps with Part D, that's how you're able to reduce that down. So again, remember, it doesn't matter if they're Slim B, if they're QI, or if they're LIS. You're always going to stick with a zero plan premium product or a low monthly plan premium product for Medicare Part C. And if it's low, you're going to use what's called LIS premium uh, reduction and coordination. Now, that is all based around what the average benchmark amount is, which the national average is about $35.12 as a whole for Part D. Also, the other thing to remember, once you put someone into a Medicare Advantage plan or into a part into a part into a part D plan, my phone is going crazy. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, into a part D plan. Again, remember some of those on their generics, they may be zero dollars. Even though the um, LIS amount may say $395, always remember the client or the member is always going to pay the lesser of the two. Even if LIS says that drug is supposed to be $395 for it's a generic, but the formulary says that it's a tier one generic and it's available at zero, that's what the client would pay, not $395. They would pay the zero copay. QI, qualified individual. As you can see, the limit is much, much higher for this, which is $1,529 for an individual on the monthly, $2,060 on a married couple. As you can see, the resource and asset limits do not change, $8,400 and $12,600. This helps pay a portion of the Part B only. As I said earlier, this is only available uh, through state funds if, in fact, uh, that money runs out, even if they do qualify for it, they're not going to be able to, um, to get it if, there, if there's no available money. The only thing that you need to determine is how much they're paying for their drugs. Not if they're a Slim B, not if they're a QI. The only, the only caveat to that is if they're a Slim B plus. And they'll typically have a card that would denote that, a Medicaid card. If I'm a Quimby, I'll also have a Medicaid card. Uh, Slim B regulars, meaning no plus, and a QI, they typically do not receive um, a state member card for Medicaid. Once you ask them about how much they're paying for their current medication, the very next thing is, is if they say, oh, I don't know, or if you're just not sure because of it's all generic medication, if they would qualify for that level, the next thing you would have to ask them is, is Miss Jones. Again, less is more. Don't make this harder than it has to be. Miss Jones, if you don't mind me asking, do you or does someone else pay your Medicare Part B premium for you every month? Oh, no, baby, I pay, uh, I pay $50 a month. Okay, in your mind, you know, we'll quit. Well, a qualified individual, they get a portion of their Part B, so they're probably a QI. Oh, no, baby, I don't pay the 233, or I don't pay, they don't take anything out of my check for that. Then you automatically know that person is a Slimby. I know that's a lot of information and a lot of content. Are you confused? Any questions? I think um Not to absorb. <laughs> what did you say, David? I said it's definitely a lot to absorb. Yeah. I just I'll ask my question at the end, John, because <laughs> I do have a question at the end. Go, well, no, go ahead. Ask before I move to the LISI. Um, the only thing, like the main thing for me with Medicaid and Medicare 
I thought Medicaid, for some reason, I this might be super off, but I thought Medicaid was like ACA. No, you can't, you can't have a Medicaid and, and ACA plans are different. For example, if I were to choose an Affordable Care Act plan, they get subsidies. Those subsidies then pay the premium for the ACA plan. Now, they can have additional state assistance if they're on like a high deductible plan, for example, where Medicaid could kick in and help. Medicaid is financial assistance. That's really what it is. It gotcha, does work. Gotcha. It does work a little differently. They don't actually provide benefit. Um, what they'll do is they pay a bill. So if I don't have, that's why ACA was so big for low income individuals, because think about this without subsidies and without the ACA, who had to pay all the bill for health services if somebody was low income? Who paid that bill? The state did, Medicaid, mm -hmm. right? If I enroll, and now if I have ACA plans, who pays a big chunk of that bill or the majority of the bill after any deductible or copay has been met? Who pays it? The carrier, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So remember, Medicaid is financial assistance. They don't actually provide any benefit. What they do is they'll supplement a benefit that's already pre-existing. For example, again, go back and think about a Quimby. And even though, you know, I wouldn't, ref I wouldn't ask you to refer to it that way. It's one of the easiest ways to remember this is that a lot of people would associate full Medicaid benefits with what would be considered the poor man's med sub F. Why? Because a plan F covers deductibles, co-payments, um, it's first dollar coverage. That's how Medicaid would work. So Medicare is the primary. Medicaid is the secondary. Just like if I'm on an ACA plan and have other health insurance with Medicaid or OHI, what it would be is the uh, ACA plan is primary. And due to their financial resources, Medicaid is the secondary. And then we'll actually help back, fill back in on the plan if they qualify. Okay, so, cool. so they can have both. Yeah. They, they, they can. It's dependent upon their level. They can have ACA plans right. and they can get financial assistance for Medicaid. Typically, though, what okay, will happen, cool. they'll get a very high um, subsidy amount and then it would be up to the uh, enrolling agent to put them on a good plan. Um, basically, that would minimize that risk and then uh, Medicaid okay, would step in and fill in the rest. That makes Wait, did you way say more sense. ACA? Thank you. You say ACA and Medicaid or ACA and Medicare? I didn't quite catch that. Med Med Medicaid, because you can't have you can't have Medicare and be on an ACA plan. Okay, that's why they, that's why they end at sixty five. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before I move on? Just remember, make it easy, guys. How much are you paying for your medication? If they tell you those set copays, you know automatically which level um, to start to steer to. And then, of course, uh, you'll do a Medicaid enrollment verification phone call um, before you actually conduct the enrollment for either Humana, United, Aetna, whomever it is. They have a Medicaid verification line that you'll actually dial into uh, just to double check yourself. I do have a quick question. Um, sure. Who would we reach out to to actually do like a policy review for a client and then find what plan is best for them um, aside just from like the software they have that compares plan side by side but somebody that's going to actually like walk us through that the first few times when we have our policies that would probably be um gina or billy they're kind of the ones that are running our our team specifically um the heartland staff obviously they're not going to speak directly to clients um but our team billy and um gina helps Gina is Billy's sister. He's been in uh, Medicare for a long time. So I'll get you um, her number if you'd like, David. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I can, I can promise you this, David. You can't make a mistake. It, it's, it's when, as you go through, and it's all formatted with the application. If you're doing it through the online enrollment tool, either through the carrier, like with Humana, for example, through Enrollment Hub, or, or, uh, or if you're doing it through Connection. Just follow the questions as you go through to complete the app and you won't make any mistakes there. Um, I've got some things as we wrap up that I'm going to show you uh, that may possibly help you even more. Uh, one, to conduct the Medicare review and two, to help double check yourself as you go through it. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. So 
It's again, it's important to remember that Medicare and Medicaid are two separate programs. Medicaid is not only for poor people, just like Medicare is not only for um, old people. In order to actually have Medicaid, uh, they, have to, they have to go to a Medicaid approved provider, meaning they have a contract with uh, the Medicaid system to actually accept payment uh, from Medicaid. Because just like with original Medicare, which is FFS, which is fee for service, meaning that uh, Medicare pays a fee for every service that you see based on where you live, what type of doctor and what type of setting it is. Uh, as an example of that, you may go to urgent care for one thing, and you may go to your provider's office or the emergency room for the exact same thing. And Medicare will actually reimburse three different amounts, depending on the type of doctor and what that setting is. Works the same way with Medicaid. When they contract to actually see Medicaid uh, members, there is a fee schedule that Medicaid works off of. And they say, OK, provider, if you see one of our Medicaid uh, recipients or beneficiaries, we're only gonna reimburse X amount of dollars for, for this particular service. So just like there's a fee for service with Medicare, Medicaid has a fee for service schedule as well. Typically by the time you combine both of those, the doctor does not receive the full amount, but that's one of the, um, one of the things they understand as they begin to accept Medicaid. That's why a lot of the doctors you don't see on Medicaid aren't in private practice. They usually work within a, um, a clinic type setting where there may be five, six, seven doctors that all work out of there, uh, out of that office for the billing on it because it helps them keep their costs down so then that way they can actually remain more profitable. We won't go through COB or coordination so we can get to the LIS. Um, I, would, I would suggest that you actually read these little Q and A's. It does explain some things which are common questions that maybe come up. Uh, for example, one that I kind of touched on a couple times is that premium that you may see and then how that's associated with uh, LIS. But I want to make sure I get to the LIS side. So LIS or low income subsidy, that's also known as extra help through the SSA.gov or the Social Security Administration. Now, that is a federal program that does help with Part D benefits. It actually is estimated that it helps about $5,100 per year. It does help with the monthly premiums for Part D, the annual deductibles, and the prescription co-insurance and co-payments. As you can see from just these bullets, that should tell you that it does not help with the medical portion at all. Who should apply? Everybody that's at or below or even just slightly above the threshold limit. Everybody should apply. As I mentioned earlier, there are literally millions of people who qualify for low income subsidy, and I'm about to show you who they are, that, I, that don't get it. What happens? Why is that important? Well, not only one, is it a service to the member or the client, because you're going to help them reduce their cost, their out-of-pocket costs for prescription medications. More importantly, what it does is when you apply for LIS, it generates an SEP or a special enrollment period. So anytime in the year, you could actually enroll someone and use that as what's called a trigger event to enroll someone into a Medicare Part C plan. Or on a quarterly event, if they're already on a plan, you can move them to another plan outside of the AEP and outside of OEP, which is the open enrollment period. The asset limits are quite high on this. So again, remember, just because if I have Medicaid, I'm always 100% LIS. There are four levels, though, uh, that are associated with low-income subsidy. At the very highest level, $16,999 for an individual's monthly income, $20,385 uh, for the individual in a yearly, $2,289 for a married couple, $27,465 for a married couple. As an individual, they, can, they cannot have assets that exceed $15,510. As an individual, they can't have assets that exceed $30,950. Now, who are the people that you have to help apply? This is just another quick cheat sheet, which will tell you. LIS, extra help. Full benefit duels. People that are 100%, which will be a Quimby status, as you can see, remember what I said earlier, $1.35, $4. If you look down the list, nobody else gets that level. 
just this person, which is a Quimby. They're considered 100% LIS. The next person would be a um, Slimby, a QI. As you can see, that person's going to pay either 395 or 985. They get catastrophic coverage. They pay nothing out of pocket. They pay no deductible. These are all of your Medicaid folks. Medicaid people are automatically enrolled in it through Social Security once they receive their benefit and they get their awards benefit statement. These are the people that have to apply every year, and there are millions of them. They are at the upper income limit of assets and money uh, to qualify. As you can see, it's not as robust. They get 15%. They're going to pay 15% of the actual drug cost until they reach catastrophic. Once they reach catastrophic, they're then going to revert to the 395, 935, or 985, I'm sorry, for generic medication. There are tons of these people. Tons. All you've got to do is ask them if they're getting assistance. If they have a myssa.gov account, you would go there, you would log in, and it would tell you. If they don't have one, you create one for them with their permission, email them the password. Say, Ms. Jones, I'm going to create an account for you. That way we can have a better uh, look into your benefits. Once I create this, I'm going to create a password for you, and I'm going to email you that password. I would suggest that either you or someone that you trust go in and then change that password to something only you know. Uh, but we're only going to use it now to help you get registered. Questions so far? So what you're going to find is, is by definition, what they count as income and assets can vary. A lot of people actually think that um, their house, their car, things like that are actually going to count. And that's why they never apply. That's where those millions of people that qualify uh, that don't get it. That's where that kind of comes from. What are the things that they're going to define as income? Well, things that can be easily converted to cash and are generating an income for you, such as uh, annuity payments, retirement accounts that are paying through or they're drawing from, their social security benefits, any money from investments and pensions, and rental property income. What are the things they're going to count as assets? These are things, again, that can be converted to cash within 30 days. But here's the big thing that a lot of people don't take into account, excluding their primary residence. What if I live in New Jersey and I was I inherited my, my parents' home, which is you know $750,000, for example. If that's my primary residence, I don't have to count that. Now, if I rent it out, then I do have to count it as an asset and I do have to count the rental income. But if I reside there, I don't even have to count that for SSA. Any cash and savings accounts, David, that's where that $70,000 uh, that was dispersed in a cash payment is going to come into play. Stocks and bonds and any annuities and mutual fund payments that I may receive. How do I help someone apply? Well, the first thing you're going to do go to ssa.gov. If you're creating a myssa.gov account, you're going to go here. Sign in, sign up. And there it is, mysocialsecurity.com. As you can see, this will give them everything, disability, survivor benefits, their retirement, how much they earn, uh, how many medications they're taking, how much they've spent out of pocket on those medications. All of that is tracked in here, as well as uh, uh, bits and pieces of that within the Medicare site. What if you want to help somebody apply for extra help? Again, remember, extra help with prescriptions. You go to menu, and it's right here. You can do a quick find out if you qualify. And then you can go apply online. There is a button for you to click that'll say uh, someone other than the applicant is actually completing this application. You just check off on that and you go through. Think about this, guys, especially as you broaden your product horizons, if you start to branch off into annuity sales or, or anything else, if you're going to apply for assistance with the government, what do they want to know? Everything. They're going to want to know about all your savings accounts, any cash, any properties, your retirement accounts. This is the easiest and most um, true way for you to do a fact finder that there really is. 
And if you take good notes, don't keep a copy of the information, but if you're taking good notes and creating that digital client file, as your product uh, bandwidth expands or as you look for other opportunities to generate income and put product uh, with your member to help them, that's a great fact finder where you can have some good notes. But yes, they qualify for Medicaid. No, they don't qualify for Medicaid. Yes, they're under 65. No, they're over 65. This is their, you know, their monthly budget or what they had in income. All of that information will help you better help that client in the future. It does take about three to five weeks uh, for you to get the decision. You can get notified quicker. That's why my SSA.gov is good because it's electronic. It doesn't take time for the processing for it to follow the route for the email notification and the mail to run. This is worst case. I have seen it within seven to 10 business days sometimes within the mysa.gov under that awards uh, benefit piece. Also, as I told David earlier, you always wanna make sure whether you think they'll qualify or not because you never know what rule changes or what may happen or truly what's in their background. Always check off, yes, to help them um, start the application process for MSP, which is Medicaid, Medicare Savings Programs. That's pretty much it on that. I have a couple of other things I can show you, Gage, if, if, uh, if I have time. Yeah, you have all the time. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get prepared for the, you know, open enrollment or, or annual enrollment. So whatever you can show us, we're here for it. Okay. Uh, so Michaela, was this, was this helpful? Did it help at all definitely. for you? No, okay. definitely. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Those poverty qualifications. I honestly thought it was one threshold. So I didn't know about those certain, but I'm still like, I haven't even done my ready to sells yet. I've been kind of distracted. So I might not be the best, uh, person to base it off of but it definitely uh, made more sense to me so thank you i have a quick question when somebody is like my mother-in-law for example 62 years young on disability when she turns 65 is it in her best interest to change up her plan or would things just stay the same no that's that's a great question and i tell you um I tell you what, I'm actually addressing that now on this MedSup and in-home uh, sales blueprint uh, training, for example, when because um, there's only a couple of times that someone will actually get uh, an additional time. Unless the policyholder is turning 65, they are subject to underwriting, which can be different from company to company. There are a few other situations that allow someone to have another guarantee issue window, like leaving private group insurance returning to a Medicare supplement after the trial uh, SCP, or to your question, David, under 65, qualified for Medicare, then turning 65. So basically what that means is, is that now they'll be able to take advantage for a med sub. Let's just say your mother-in-law has very high utilization right now um, because due to her disability. You don't want her to be nickel and dime. This would be one of the rare times that she would not have to go through underwriting on a, on a med sub, for example, a plan, uh, a high deductible plan G. It covers everything but the part B deductible. That's the one time that's gonna be left for her unless your state has a birthday rule that she would be able to move into that med sub and get the lowest possible premium, monthly premium with absolutely no underwriting. So at 65, if you help someone, that's why at under 65, most people will usually choose an MA plan and then once they turn 65 is when they might move to a med sub and or maybe change their plan. But 62 years young, that means she's got three years. MA, MA is uh, an annually renewable contract, meaning those plans can change year over year. New plans can come in the market. Your opportunity is to help her for the next two years with an MA plan to make sure she has the right one. And then 90 days to six months out from T65 or turning 65, you can then reevaluate the policy and based on her utilization and budget, see if maybe a plan F or a plan G uh, would actually be the right case because you can get those for, depending on where you live, for anywhere from say $96 up to say $115 a month. But if her income amount doesn't change, you can see where if she's only drawing 1200 bucks, now you're talking about taking at least a hundred bucks and then every year that premium is gonna go up though as she continues to age, you gotta bear that in mind. Did that answer your question, David? Medicare Advantage for until she's 65 and then reevaluate her plan. That's correct. All right. I think I got it. 
I'm all about the details, guys. The details are what's going to keep you compliant and keep you out of trouble um, with, with MA. The other thing is, because it is, you know, heavily regulated, um, I would really learn about VA training, CHAMP VA, because that's another missed opportunity from a lot of agents. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to show you. I know you said at the beginning of the call about those reviews. That's kind of where we're starting since this is our first, um, you know, or um, annual enrollment. So thank you. If you that was it. I knew there was one other thing. I just couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Yeah, like doing the reviews would be great. So that's where we're all starting. So thank you for that. So what you guys, this is, um, if you get this printed up, if you get this printed up on, uh, not on your home printer, unless you've got a nice home printer, you can do it in color. And then what you can actually do, um, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to work with you on a rebrand if you want to use the Safe Haven logo. Uh, on it and make it more agency specific. Um, however, you can print this up on what's called uh, on semi-gloss paper, put it in uh, into a three ring binder, or if you're doing a Zoom meeting, show it up on the screen, and then you kind of go through it. As you can see, this will take you step by step for a Medicare review to help you stay on target and keep you from deviating to a bunch of different stuff. So, you know, it kind of goes through what Medicare is, what Medicare is, the different choices they have, the part A, part B, which one of those covers, how much it is on a per day basis to use the services. Uh, but it, it walks you through every single piece on the Medicare review, even up to how to calculate the, uh, the part B premium, which again is based on their IRS tax return from two years prior uh, aging into Medicare. That's what determines what they're gonna pay in a monthly premium amount. Uh, for their Part B coverage. Then it will take you down through uh, the different ways that you can get it, the original gaps, Medicare approved health plans, which is the proper name for Part C, not Medicare Advantage. They are, they are categorized as a Medicare approved health plan. Um, so when you look at that, you can say, well, that's all well and good, but John, what do I actually say? Which is why I asked you guys, have you conducted any already? And do you know what you're going to say? Well, since this isn't my first rodeo and I've helped thousands of agents, again, remember, I'm all about the details. So this is over the top. Will you say all this? Absolutely not. If you can remember bits and pieces of it, you will sound very confident, very confident. People will not question what you say. You will sound like an expert at that which you do and they will buy. This teaches you how to talk about each one of those pages. The things that you can say, how to explain what Medicare is, because what you wanna do is you, you, want, you don't want to be disparaging on, uh, on a Medicare review, but in the very beginning of that conversation and that review, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're really talking about the limitations on original Medicare. So get in the habit of that guys, as you're talking about Medicare, Either call it traditional, but original is better. Original Medicare, original Medicare and a Medicare supplement. Medicare Part C, which is a part of the Medicare program and you saw all the rights, privileges, protections, and guarantees you've always enjoyed. As you can see, original Medicare and a supplement, original Medicare. That's how you can start to differentiate between them and the client doesn't get confused. Because if you always just say Medicare, Medicare becomes synonymous with everything. Yeah, that's that's definitely what we've been doing. So I appreciate you mentioning that. No worries. Um, but then, as you can see, this will take you while the while there while the benefits may all be the same, you may choose to receive your benefits in a variety of different ways. Here are your four ways that they can actually get their Medicare on original, original with a med sup, Part D, and then Part C. And think about what I just said. Medicare Part C is a part of the Medicare program and you would uh, still have all, that's what I just said to you guys. That's the other thing. If you want to stay out of compliance problems, what you want to do is you never want to fly by the seat of your pants. You want to be, you want to be very consistent in your messaging. You want to say the same thing every time. It's even more important because uh, from my understanding, you guys are generating a lot of sales and you're going to conduct a lot of this over the phone. It's recorded now. 
you don't want to mess up. That's why I would encourage you to read, read, read this. Be very careful about some of the things you change and make sure that you're touching on these so that way you can satisfy what would be considered a Medicare review. And also the language that's in this is compliant. But I'll take you step by step and teach you what you could say and how to explain the benefits. Like this explains the quarters, 29 quarters or less, they're gonna pay $4.99 a month. If they're working 30 to 39 quarters, they pay $2.74, that's for part A. Remember I said, if they're a Quimby status and even if they didn't work their quarters, Medicaid pays that premium. And what, because if, if you read through this over and over guys, you'll be a Medicare master, honestly, and you'll understand. That's why I give you so many details how these bits and pieces all work together, how to explain it, but that also allows you to create that opportunity uh, while you're sitting in front of a client. Like if I were to ask you guys about lifetime reserve days, could you tell me what it is? Well, here's how that breaks down. And as you can see, it's only a couple of sentences to explain how that works. And then, but if you also had a poo-poo on things, so then that way you can build value in either one, a MedSup, and or two, a Medicare Part C plan. What if um, you needed to explain skilled nursing? Everything and how it works is all in there, home health care. In addition to that, how many of you know how to actually calculate the Part B premium if you run into somebody or the Part B penalty? Here's your example. Remember, I just told you about the, IR, about the uh, AGR, the adjusted gross income. This explains to you exactly how it would work. Because some clients, if they have a Part B only or, or a Part A only and you put them in B, or they're a veteran and they never got their Part B, veterans medical benefits are not considered creditable coverage. So they're gonna be penalized 10% um, for every year. And that's a full 12 month cycle. So 10% for every year since they first became eligible. You need to be able to calculate that. So that way you don't get a nasty gram and they issue a complaint because you didn't tell them they were gonna have a penalty. But then it also tells you why they need it and what the hospital bills look like um, and how you can help defray that cost. So it's all feature function benefit and then qualifying question, but it does this step by step. What are the ways on the MedSup training? Issue age, attained age, community base, how they do it, what it's good for, when they can enroll, and then a little bit that's compliant about what you can talk about with Part C because you can't talk about plan benefits like a zero plan premium. You can't talk about dental, vision, hearing, over the counter. Anything that's not covered under original Medicare if you don't have a scope of appointment form with permission to contact for a true Medicare uh, Advantage appointment, you cannot say anything about those things. You can only talk about the things, for example, that I have covered in here. You can't talk about any specific benefits that are outside of original Medicare. I can send you this. You guys can read through this, um, and this will teach you what to say about original Medicare as you're conducting your Medicare review um, in order to build value in both your MedSup as well as your MA. The other thing that I can do for you, this is a inbound call center script that I had CMS compliance approved. It's a little older, so I would need to refresh it. This is from the call center that I ran. So um, as you can see, it does have a CMS approval number on it, but I can give you, and I can refresh this some, and I can give you a sample to David's point, or if it wasn't David, I apologize to whomever it was that asked earlier. Um, just about the steps in the call and the process, but this actually walks you through step by step an inbound enrollment that you can follow to make sure and give you a very good idea of what CMS is going to be looking for and how to explain things when you're conducting an enrollment now that your uh, now that your call is now recorded. Yeah, that'll be huge. Thank you. We just had a call last week about a guy going in home and he was saying, he's like, I replaced all your guys' policies to be doing it over the phone. So we're already kind of like a little eerie or yeah, eerie of, uh, you know, doing it over the phone. So this will be super helpful knowing what we can and cannot say. And guys, I am super salesy. So I don't want you to think it's just dry because it's really not. It's engaging. It gets people excited about the benefits. It adds enough value content so that way you can have the right value proposition. You know, even if, for example, David, God, I hate to keep singling you out. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, you know, not sorry. David. Please do, man. I'll take all the ass kickings I can get right now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry, David. But what I'm going to do is on 
<clears throat> I know we talked about um, B-SNP a lot. Um, I'll take this even further for you guys. For example, if you're in a market that has a DSNP plan sale, this will take you step by step through an enrollment to actually explain if you're in home, you can use some of it while you're on the phone as well when you're talking about a particular carrier, how to actually do the value proposition page, by, because this is an enrollment guide for a DSNP plan, page by page. By page, so you can get a good idea of how to. And look, I even give you some Medicaid pieces on there, how to identify it for you, just to give you a refresher, um, what to talk about within each one of the columns. But more importantly, it gives you a way that you can actually explain it to the member what things are covered, what things aren't covered, if it's gender specific, if it's not gender specific, what things to throw in there, any of the additional value adds, because everything you say on a DSNP is to get to all the, is to get to this section, benefits and services beyond original Medicare. That's really where the meat and potatoes of a DSNP plan is. That's where you want to spend the majority of your time, but you can use what's nice about this is as you explain those benefits, all you have to do is take out company A benefit, insert company B copay and benefit, but you explain them all the same. And it'll take you through like um, the hearing aids, dental, the vision, if they get a Phillips lifeline, you know, I'll fall in and I can't get up kind of deal. Um, if they have over-the-counter benefits, making sure, giving you some key points, making sure that you have the catalog so you can show it or the PDF of it so you can show the client uh, by asking them questions. That way you can turn to those pages and show them things they're currently spending out of pocket for on OTC is covered. Um, they can go to local Walgreens, Rite Aid, Walmart, and a lot of them and actually spend uh, on their debit card. Um, that they'll get on it if it has a grocery benefit. If you run into anybody who has CHAMP VA, well, what is CHAMP VA? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. OHI, I even give you the forms, the most, the drugs they cover for free, what forms they have to actually file, how all of that works step by step, but it gets better. I'll take you all the way to the in-home presentation. This uses a Humana Honors Plan, which is an MA only, meaning no drug benefit. I give you all the pros and cons of it, what things to actually make sure you look out for so you can conduct an enrollment, not generate a complaint, um, and what you say or what you could say, but it's a thorough explanation of it so that way you understand because if you understand it, you can simplify it. So this is all, this is, this is the sizzle and the meat and the bone, and what you're going to do is you're going to simplify this down, but you have to have a good understanding of how it works and why it works that way so you can easily explain it. Because if you easily explain it and then you start chopping stuff off of it and you really don't understand it, I, I can guarantee you, you're probably going to get a complaint. Because it's very important when you deal with CHAMP or even if you're dealing with VA, because they're not one and the same. VA benefits are entirely different. They're networks where you can use it, how it all works, which priority group they're in, uh, one through eight. But I'll give you an example, what laws state that they can't just go anywhere and who's going to pay. Some other examples, how the donut hole works, but I'll also give you what? An in-home sample presentation, which will do the same thing. As you can see, guys, I've already written it all out for you. This is like the Bible right here, the Medicare Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and if you're really, guys, if you're struggling with your... I'll go through and I'll make sure I address all this before we leave all, all the, the comments. Um, if you're struggling on your A and B, there's a whole PowerPoint for it. What Medicare is, all the different benefits, but I give you a little bit more than I would in the Medicare review. Um, so you really understand. And then like, for example, if you guys were confused on the FFS, the fee for service, the Medicare approved amount, I explained that all to you. I explained to you what like a Part C is, that it's a capitated health plan, meaning they receive a set amount uh, for each member based on overall utilization. How it actually helps us is going to allow us to um, allow Medicare to continue on uh, prior to its uh, insolvency, which is very close. Because there are currently 64, almost 65 million people on it. By 2026, there's going to be 71 million. Here's what I can tell you. We've all been promised leads in the past. We all buy leads, direct mail, internet, social media. Honestly, guys, this is one of the few times I can tell you without any gloss over that there are truly more people than we can help. There are only 
1.2 million licensed agents around the country. There are 65 million Medicare beneficiaries. 44% of them have chosen Medicare Part C. That number was down in the 20 percentile range uh, just a few years ago. That number is expected to exceed 50%. The majority or the vast majority of individuals that are aging into Medicare because they're coming off group insurance, think about it, affordable and predictable co-payments, HMOs, PPOs. What does it work like? It works like what they already know. They choose those plans. They save that Part D. They get the additional benefits that Medicare doesn't normally cover. Those that are currently on MedSupps, they're either switching to a Plan G or they're choosing a Medicare Advantage. Nobody remains on just original Medicare. And once you read through the training, you'll understand all the financial limitations like no stop loss. Uh, you just get bill after bill after bill. Multiple doctors can bill you for the same service based on consultations and how that can literally bankrupt you should in fact you have some type of catastrophic illness or loss or extended stay in the hospital. Our goal is to help them reduce their overall health care costs as much as possible. So those are the two ways that you're able to do that. So let's see here. Sweet was just going to ask for the PowerPoint. Yes, you get that. That's huge. Do you or does someone else pay for your Medicare Part B premium? Right, like Medicaid. That's or because a third party administrator, uh, Michaela may pay for it, for example. Um, and if they say, well, no, Sorry, I, don't I, was pay for just, it. I was just posting that in the chat because you had said that so people could write okay. it down. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay, that's good. Let's see. I'm going to need these slides and to replay the video. So Michaela will have that. I'll send out uh, PowerPoints if you ask me. Uh, in your first year, what's a realistic goal for, for, okay, Frank, let's talk about that. Realistic first goal, are you talking about for the year or are you talking for the entire year? Or are you talking about just for AEP? Did you hang up on me, Frank? I think he was just talking about AEP. Okay, for, um, Oh yeah, he, he put it in the chat, he put AEP up. Okay, so for AEP, how many, how big is your book of business? Your current book of business of life sales and how many of those individuals are on Medicare? Do you have any idea? That's gonna factor in zero, okay? So starting fresh. Um, are you buying leads, Frank? Sorry, I'll hop on here instead. <laughs> I'll hop on here I instead. Just, I can't just throw out a number. I just, because I don't want to give you an unrealistic expectation. Um, yeah. Do you, are you buying leads now? So I will. They... So no, I, I, I will. Uh, I will buy leads. That's not, that's, uh, that's not an issue. Um, so whatever it takes to uh, have the best possible chances of success, definitely. Dude, a realistic goal for the first seven weeks, um, since you have zero, uh, zero uh, books of business or zero clients and you haven't been helping anybody through the year is this all brand new to you I mean for life insurance yes correct correct I'm gonna I, I used to be on the life side and then I came back into construction and now I want to go back into uh, the Medicare instead of life depending on what your call schedule looks like Frank I, I, honestly between 100 and 175 and we can drill that down a little bit more but your bare minimum okay. goal for that seven week period because think about this guys 60% of all Medicare Advantage sales for agents are typically driven during that seven-week window. 60% of your entire yearly Medicare Advantage sales as an average are typically driven just during that seven-week window. So... I would say that a bare minimum goal, Frank, should be 100. If you are if you have enough dial time, if you have enough activity and you have the lead flow that's coming in. Also, if you're asking the very simple question from every life lead, this, it's a very simple question. You know, Ms. Jones, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to help you today with your final expenses. You know, if you don't mind me asking, who or what you currently use for your health care? Oh, you've got Medicare. Well, guess what, Ms. Jones? I also help my clients with that as well. You know, would you have, um, are you available tomorrow? You are. Would it be okay if I gave you a call back and that way we can conduct a Medicare review? We can really talk about what your Medicare options are. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, great. Um, so again, just as confirmation, I'm going to give you a call tomorrow at one o'clock. 
uh, and we're going to be covering um, all of your Medicare options. That may include Medicare supplements, uh, a Medicare Part C or an Advantage plan, uh, Part D, and any other health-related products that you may be eligible for. There's your scope of appointment form or your SOA right there. It doesn't necessarily have to be on paper, but you do need to make sure you get those bullets that I just kind of went through. Now you have your SOA. Now when you call tomorrow um, from your life lead, now you do the Medicare review. And then what's critical is the client then begins to initiate the conversation, either about a MedSup or an MA, and then um, you're off to the races. Does that make sense? So 100 to yes, 100. Definitely. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. 100 to 175. The other thing I would get in the habit of, guys, as you're getting your life leads through the year, if they don't qualify for LIS, if they're not Medicaid, you're not going to be able to help them move outside of the AEP unless they're already on a plan for OEP or uh, open enrollment period. So what you want to do is you want to collect all that data into client files because to David's point, well, how much do I do, which is why I asked this question, what you want to do is you want to set yourself up for success for the next AEP where you can write 225, 250, 300, 300 plus. Here's what I do know. Is if you have the right call volume, you're seeing enough people in person, um, there are going to be a lot of people that you can't help through the year. You collect that data. And what you say is, is you say, Ms. Jones, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like you're going to qualify for any additional assistance now. You're getting everything that you do qualify for. What I'd like to give you, what I'd like to do is give you a call in the next 90 days or less just to check in on you and make sure nothing's changed. And they'll say, okay, because a permission to contact or a PTC is only good for 90 days. So then that way, what you're doing is you're setting up a time 90 days out where you're following back up just to refresh that permission to contact. And you'll have to do that once in the year. Then by the time you get to that, the third quarter, you're going to be calling all those people anyway in September, uh, end of August, the first part of September. And you're going to say, Miss Jones, you may or may not be aware of this, but you know, there are always changes within the Medicare and your benefits. Um, you're going to be eligible for the open enrollment period of Medicare. What I'd like to do are there going to be new plans that might be available to you, which you could qualify for, or you will be qualifying um, to be able to make an election or a choice? What I'd like to do, Ms. Jones, is give you a call and um, go through what your 2023 options or 2024 options at that point would look like. Agents who do that, they use what's called the pre-AEP, which is the 1st through the 14th of October. In any of their pre-existing business that they've already written, they shore that up. And then what they do is any of that um, any of that stuff they've stacked through the year, you call that and you work that the 1st through the 14th. Now, you can't take an enrollment, but you can go ahead and sell it. You can mail them an enrollment. You can get the buy-in on it. Then you can schedule a bunch of appointments for the 15th, 16th, 17th, and then just go in and just do application, application, application with them and go through the online app. And what, what will happen is, is that anywhere from 50 to 125 applications are usually written the 1st through the 15th for life, from life agents who just stack up all that business through the year that they could not help. If you can get in the habit of doing that and keeping very detailed client notes, you're almost guaranteed success and a very fast start to your AEP. That way, when the 15th hits... All the way through the seventh, your focus is not on servicing your pre-existing book or trying to help those people, but it's about acquisition of new clients for your book. So that way you can generate the largest AEP check that you'll get the first couple of weeks of January um, that you can possibly have. Let's see. Hey, hey John. Hey. Could you just could you just reiterate that again for me? So for the October 1st to the 14th, you can get those applications lined up with your current book of business. That's correct. Your current book of business, because what you want to do is that 1st through the 14th or that two-week window, what you guys want to focus on is everything that you've already written an MA on. If a new plans come out and you need to switch them or people that you helped with life insurance through the year, you obtained that scope of appointment form and by virtue of that, the permission to contact, you pitch them on their new plans. That way your lead flow starts on the 15th and then um, the 15th through the 7th of December, your only focus is on acquisition of new stuff, people you haven't talked to, not conservation of your book, which is service work if a new plan comes in or people that you spoke to through the year that you couldn't help. 
Now, again, the one caveat to that is, is the first through the 14th um, per CMS, you're not supposed to take an application, nor can you do an online enrollment. But what you can do is you can talk about all the 2023 benefits because you can't talk about those until October 1. Make sense what I just said? Do you see how to tie all that together? Did that clear yeah. up? Again? Yeah, no, I'm following you. So the first through the 14th, you can do, do pretty much everything besides the actual application. Correct. And then, um, for example, you know, Gage, to use you as an example and, and get some of my focus off poor David, what we can do is because, you know, in talking with you, uh, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, you said there were about 12,600 people in the local area that you were going to work with, about 57,000 people in the surrounding, or maybe that was in total. 50% of yep, your that's... business AEP was going to be uh, front-loaded, and you're going to do some call center, 50%. 50% at the start of the AEP for uh, in-person sales. So what you could do, was any of that inaccurate, Gage, from last week? Well, I think if I'm being honest with you, I think I'm going to eliminate the phone sales. I'm going to do everything in person this AEP. So you I live in out. Dallas. Okay. I live in Dallas. The area you're referring to, John, just so you got some clarity on it, is my hometown back in Illinois. Right. But I live in Dallas, Texas, which obviously I know there's more than tons of opportunity here. And just learning more about the in-person versus over the phone, I personally just think it'd be more beneficial for me this AEP period to do everything in person and here locally to Dallas. And then obviously stuff back home um, that I can generate. So you have two, okay, perfect. So you have two options then, Gage, of, of, and, and it would be the same, it would be the same recommendation to anybody else on the phone. The first thing to do is, is everybody, the first to the 14th that you can go see, you start, you start going and seeing them. Conduct the presentation. Have the pre-enrollment kit, which is the paper application. You can fill the application out. The only thing you can't do is take it. However, the client can mail it in or you can stop back by on the 15th or after all those people that you've already gone and seen and then collect the application. And then all you have to do is make sure the signature date and the, the signature and the signature date um, with a January 1 requested effective date line up and they all and, and they all say uh, October 15th. They can't be dated before the 15th. And then you can physically take the application. If you leave it behind, the client can mail the application in. I don't like doing that, that last one because I want to make sure the app gets submitted. You know what I'm saying? Because here's the other thing to remember, guys, during AEP, just because you take the app doesn't mean it's what's going to get issued. Well, this is the only time this works this way is during AEP. The last one in wins the race. So the last app that CMS has logged as of December 7th at 1159 before it flips to 12.8 is the agent and is the plan that will get issued. So if you hit a bunch of people in the first, you didn't do a good job with your client services. So now, Ms. Jones, this is the busiest time of year for Medicare. You may receive a call. Somebody else may come by. They may want to switch you on, on to something else. However, based on the information that you shared with me today, this is one of the best plans available to you based on your specific condition, based on the doctors that you see. All the things that you gather during that call are the reasons that I recommended this plan to you. before. You give any of your information out to anyone else or conduct another application. Please just give me a call just so we can review it, just to make sure that I haven't left some question unanswered or some uh, issue unresolved. Um, because again, based on what you shared with me today, in my opinion, I feel that this is one of the best plans that you could choose based on doctor acceptance, based on your current conditions, based on the extra benefits you want at OTC, dental, vision, hearing, whatever it may be. Make sure you do that because if somebody comes in behind you all the way up until December 7th and they convince them either over the phone or in person to switch that plan, they can take another application and you'll be thinking that you'll get credit for that sale and you may not. We love scripts around here. Good, scripts keep you compliant. Uh, and they, they keep you consistent with the delivery of your message. Um, I like blueprints and scripts as well. Will these numbers be? Yes, those numbers change every single year. Typically, um, you know, you can get some early indication of the Medicare numbers. 
Uh, typically, it's in um, late September for a middle to the middle part of October that you'll begin to see them. And then the FPL number does change every year because it's also based around these uh, COLA or the cost of living adjustment that's done in the third quarter of every year, as well as the, the Part B premium and what it would increase to. Yeah, we need these slides. Thank you. You're welcome. Just send us the whole folder. <laughs> Um, I have one even better for you. Um, we've created a training and compliance center. I've uploaded all this stuff. I'm just waiting for uh, IT to make it live that you guys will have access to through Reagan that you can log into and I'll have compliance stuff in there. I'll have sales training stuff in it. I'll have other little tips and tricks as it goes on. AEP, annual enrollment period, um, once a year. Again, that's October 1 through December 7th. That's my cell phone number. Um, so please don't blow me up if I don't answer it. It's not because I don't want to. It's because I can't shoot me a text. And if I'm able to respond right then to you, I will. But I do respond to everything by close of business. And I'm pretty quick to respond to stuff. Um, you know, if you work in a clinic, a setting, and if you work with like... Um, some of the other managed care offices, like for example, uh, Oak Street Health and your agent of the day, it can vary. I would encourage all of you um, because what, what they can't do is they can't, the, the provider's office or clinic, they can't actually steer anyone to one particular plan. If, they, if they're referring people over to you, I, I mean, I don't know because it would depend on where you live and how many uh, patients they're actually serving. It'll probably be very similar because uh, a lot of those people will probably already be on a plan. Um, you already know who the doctors that they see are, so you won't have to worry about having to switch a doctor like you would uh, over to Oak Street Health, for example, if they weren't on an Oak, if they if they weren't already an Oak Street member. Um, maybe two to three a day, and again, it's really going to depend on the clinic and how many patients they serve. But I would say, you know, possibly two, you could possibly not see, but possibly get two to three enrollments. Um, if you have new plan designs that are available in that market, uh, Nicole, uh, it it's could be. It's actually um, Oak Street House that I'll be working for. Oh, it is Oak Street. Okay. Uh -huh. um, two to five, if they're coming into Oak Street already, they, they you know, unless they were from the invites and, and not an Oak Street member already, you know, mm -hmm. maybe maybe two to five. Okay. On, on average. Mm -hmm. Could be less. Again, it depends if it's a new location, if it's pre-existing, how much marketing they actually sent out to get people to come in um, to experience the differences in the services and the value-based care model that Oak Street uh, has. Um, if it's you know, the other thing is if you can figure out a way to participate on their social days, which where they have hairdressers and just games and different things. Um, mm -hmm. Just remember, unless you're in the office that they designate, anytime you go into either Section 8 housing, low income housing, which is another great way to, to double up and see a lot of people, just make mm -hmm. sure you stay in the common area. It is a little different at the clinic, but yeah, maybe, maybe two to five. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. I mean, I definitely, I definitely wouldn't say no to the enrollments. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? <laughs> I definitely wouldn't say no, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're going to make the agent of the day there. 60% um, of all Medicare sales, perfect. Would it be non-compliant to fill out an application in home on 10-6 and have a client sign it 10-15 um, so you can take it with you and not have to? No, yes, it would be very, you cannot take the application. I don't think there's any other way I can say it. You cannot take the application. You must leave it there at the client's home. And they either one, have to mail it in or two, you have to come back because the 15th is the actual start of the application day. Pre-AEP is to discuss the benefits or any changes. You can actually start taking applications and take them from the agent either, or I'm sorry, from the member, either online or in person on the 15th. No sooner than should, in fact, a complaint arise and it's discovered through CMS that you've taken the application early or you went out on the second and the client didn't mail it in or you didn't come back out and a lot of that stuff does come out eventually, um, it can be big trouble for you because that is a huge compliance violation.
and you can lose your appointment and also jeopardize uh, your back end money. This is okay. not like selling life, guys, on any level. After the 15th, you could say, take the application with you and submit it? Oh, that's correct. Or you, you can do it in home online with them. Correct. And take correct? The, and online enrollment at that time. But you cannot complete or you cannot complete an application and submit it until the 15th. Okay. So through the 15th, it's like kind of like start planting the seeds, getting your past clients that you've already helped with the life side, let them know, hey, this, that, and then it's something that's going to be in place. All that has to get after the 15th. And then after the 15th, any in homes, you can go and submit right then and that there. Is, that is 100% accurate. Okay. Um, if you do it in home and you do it during that pre AEP sale, uh, Tom Robert, what you can do is, is turn around and, and just in um, either one, leave the app. And that way, all you got to do is pick it up uh, or the client can mail it in. But like I said, I don't like the client to mail it in because I never know. And I want to make sure I have that yeah. application. And it's getting submitted. And just so you guys are aware, October 1st is significant is because that's when the new plans are rolled out and are public to agents. So now you can go into your uh, Connect shirt, you can go into your CSG and see the new benefits for these specific plans in the spe specific area. So now if you go in there and look at it, you're looking at the 2022 plans. October 1st, the 2023 plans will be updated in there. So that's what he's saying. The first, the 14th is really when you're comparing their last year to uh, this year's plans, or you're talking to your current book of business about the plans um, that have rolled out for the new 2023 season. So it's pre AEP because you can talk about the benefits. You can compare their plans. You can, set up the date to submit the application after the 15th. Is all that accurate, John? That is 100% accurate. Okay. That's considered October 1, guys, is considered the first official marketing date for the next year plan sales. And that's what pre-AEP is, is marketing. I'm marketing a 2023 plan. The first application date is October 15th. That's the first day I can conduct an application and either submit it electronically and or take it with me. So to answer your question, Joe, I know you asked about, you know, seeing somebody pre the 15th, leaving the application, having them date it. You can do pretty much everything John just mentioned, but you're not submitting the application or leaving it with the open date. You can call them over the phone and just take care of them over the phone. Is that right, John? That's, that's accurate. You can, but what you can't do is what he alluded to here is sign it, you know, 1015 so you can take it with you and not have to revisit that home. That's the non compliant part. Yes. Yep. And so that's what I'm saying is like, if you, I think what he's referring to is if he is in a city where he's no longer going to be, how could he still get that person to do the call application? And do it over, call and do it, can, do it online. Yep. You can just do it over the phone for Correct. any of those situations. Correct. Okay. okay. So kind of going to that, John, say that because you obviously we were talking about like how it's a lot going to be a lot more harder over the phone just because the compliances and everything, right? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I was it's going to be a lot. Know. We're kind of starting to try to way stay away from the phone, right? Because it's going to be a lot more harder with compliances. And I wouldn't well, say that it's harder. If anything, it'll, I'm going to tell you why I like phone sales. Uh, and, and why I'm not discouraged by the recording, because there are a couple of different ways when CTMs, which are compliance violations, when CTMs come in, it can either be inconclusive, unfounded, or founded. And then it becomes a really he said, she said. If you do it over the phone and it's recorded, is there any way that it becomes he said, she said? And really it's a great measure to protect a writing agent against crazy ass comments from Medicare people where they're being coached by other agents so they can get your deal. That's the reality of it, guys. I'm just going to talk because I'm a field agent. That's what the frick goes on. They coach people to make a complaint on you so they get a retroactive disenrollment or so they can do another one. That's why it's important that you make sure that you're prefacing it all with, hey, Make sure you call me. Don't do anything with anybody else. Call me first if you have any questions. Here's my direct number so you can reach me. 
why it's good B that if you're doing it over the phone and it's recorded now, there is no, he said, well, they didn't say this. They told me I didn't have to worry about this for my drug plan. They said this was covered. Uh-uh. Here, look, I covered it, which is why, again, is if you look at the script that I previously wrote, you can see how in-depth it is about explaining the benefits. That's why it's so compliant. But it sells you at the same time. And it's got, and it's got a particular flow to it as you go through it all. And then that way, again, you have no actual, and this was a multi-plan. So this was a, this script was available for any plan that was available on the marketplace. There's just a few extra disclaimers that you have to use now, but that way, again, it can never be a, he said, she said, and that way you never get a founded complaint because complaints are bad, whether it's inconclusive, unfounded or founded. All of them are bad. They all carry a certain stigma. And over time, they can add up and make you lose your carrier appointment and ultimately, potentially, your ability to sell within this marketplace, which could also jeopardize any renewal stream that you may have built up. Okay. So now let's just say, hey, I went in there, me, John, I went in there, I did a presentation with you, right? And we're not going to submit this until, until after the 15th, right? But we're going to do it online. Now, obviously everything, the presentation, everything went good. So now when we're submitting it, is am I doing like a whole another presentation? You know, because it's recorded and you're doing it via telesales, if it's not a fresh up, Robert, I would say that at a bare minimum from the notes that you have, you know, you know, Ms. Jones, based on the conversation that we had. Previously, um, right? During pre, ex okay. Exactly. But you want to shore up and get, get some, get some, plausible deniability within the recording if you've done it before and instead of just saying and just talking and saying you know five dollar copay for pcp well based on what you shared with me going to this particular doctor when we met then talk about the, the pcp add in a little extra verbiage if you're going to do it over the phone since it is recorded and i mean you guys are, are all smart individuals um to make sure that you're forward thinking enough to where you can have pd or plausible deniability that you did cover those things and that way it doesn't become he said she said so if you've done a full presentation already add just enough um fat meat to to the enrollment call just to make sure say now if you remember or do you have any questions on what we originally covered about the primary care physician because i have your physician down as dr goldman he's at 1689 stratusburg street is that correct still miss jones it is okay great yes. Like hitting those bullet points that you know that need to kind of get said, right? Like, yeah, hey, this is the these, plan. These, this is your doctor. These are the medications, or however correct. Yeah. Okay, correct. And get them. And before you just move on, make sure that you get a verbal agreement. Yes, Robert, that's accurate. Yes, that's what we talked about. Or no, Robert, my medications have changed since we spoke. Or my doctor just told me he's going to be putting a new. One. No problem, Miss Jones. Let me go ahead and look that up and make sure this plan's formulary is going to cover that medication. You see where I'm kind of going with it all? Yeah, Just no, of course. Yeah, yeah. CYA I agree. yourself, man. CYA yourself. And that's why the car reporting is so good because what it's going to allow you the opportunity to do is to be able to refute allegations that are made um, because people, one, either didn't understand or two, because another agent may be coaching them. Okay. How many Medicare plans? Why, Curling don't sell. I started in Medicare Advantage. I was the uh, senior vice president of Medicare sales for the assurance group. We did about 50,000 MA enrollments a year through our um, through our uh, career force, which, you know, 15,000 of those enrollments. Uh, a there's an elevator to the right. What's that? I'm sorry, I was talking to you to my bad. Okay. Um, and 15,000 of those sales uh, about 13,800 of them were written by 426 agents just for United Healthcare. When I personally went out and sold before I left the field, because I've run an agency, I've, you know, I've worked with carriers, I've designed plans as well, uh, plus created training. I mean, I was writing during its heyday because uh, we didn't have all the rules and regulations. I would, I would write on average 33 to 35 of them a week. Um, I still have some renewal and I haven't serviced any of that book, quite honestly since 2009. I actually have a little bit of renewal coming in. So it really wouldn't be relevant to me. What I would say is, as an individual that was a final expense producer only, took me three years to get him to sell MA. 
because uh, he was so FE driven that what he turned around and did is um, in three years, I mean, last year he wrote for the entire year, he wrote 1,150 MA plans on top of selling some final expense. Uh, but if you turn around, look at the persistency, Medicare supplements about 88%. Medicare Advantage is between 85 and 88%, which is why that dream calculator reflects that in the overall persistency. So if you service it, and if you don't sell on a copay, guys, which is $5 for your PCP, if you make it exciting and you sell on the value proposition of the company, the breadth of product, the excitement within the marketplace, and not on an inpatient copay or a PCP, people can't come in and just switch you and you'll find that you'll have a higher persistency. The other thing is, if you market and sell to dual eligibles, people who are Medicare, Medicaid, they are some of the most persistent in the market with an average lifespan of four and a half years on the books before they change, unless you help them change because a new plans come out. I hope that answered your question, David. Uh, I answered the second one in the end. You're welcome. Which would you advise for new agents, telesales or in-home? Oh, God. You know, I like in-home guys because you can see them, you can play off of them. You can see more, you can talk to more people in telesales, but you burn through a lot more leads. Um, you can't door knock a true Medicare advantage. People can just ignore you on the telesales. I think they just, you know, I think they both have their pros and cons. If, if you're buying direct mail, I would say in-home. If you have a steady supply of internet leads or you're buying aged Medicare supplement leads, which are pennies on the dollar, a dollar or less, and conducting a Medicare review, then collecting the SOA, then on a follow-up call, not same day, at least the next day, uh, based on what the client initiated uh, and pitching um, a Medicare Part C plan, same day if you want to do Medicare Advantage. Uh, I mean, I, I think from a telesales standpoint, that has its advantages. You just burn through more leads. Oh, I'm at the end of the questions. What? All right. Thank you so much for your time. This is super, super helpful. We definitely need a little bit more detailed, so I, I really appreciate it. Jared's not here, so she didn't last as long. What's that? I was just making a joke. I said, Jared's not here, so the questions are at the end. You know, <laughs> I would say, guys, and I know I feed you through a fire hose, um, but when you, unfortunately or fortunately, depending, I guess, on how you look at it, I write like I speak, <laughs> which is a lot of detail. But again, you'll have a really good understanding of how it works, because what you got to what you got to realize is, is you're going to run into people who have OHI or other health insurance. They maybe have a group plan, a state retiree plan. They may have CHAMP VA. They may have Medicaid. They may have regular VA assistance. Um, they may have an old legacy retirement plan. You got to understand COB or coordination of benefits because you're going to, if you're, if you're out trying to drive enrollments, you're going to run into a bunch of different scenarios. That's what I want. You can't mess up on this guys, unless you take an enrollment or you lie to someone. That is the easiest and the best way for me to help you create opportunity and figure out how to do it. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the things that you've read, and I'm going to show you exactly or tell you exactly where I would go. Well, this is what I would do, Michaela, for example, to find this. If they told me they had this, and I would go look here, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll teach you the steps. The only way for me, that way you don't have to ask me all the time in the future, and that's how you learn, guys. You, get, you learn by failure, not by success, because if you're succeeding, well, learn anything, right? So you learn through failure. You learn because you don't know. When you collect good notes, you can't just give me a generalization. You got to give me more because when you call me or you text me, I'm going to ask you for details. Well, what state are they in? Are they married? Are they filing jointly? Do they have other people? Kind of the same thing you saw because those things will dictate what you're able to help that person do or if you can actually put them in a plan. And I'll walk you through those scenarios. And the only way that we're going to uncover that together is when you're out assessing need and you're talking to people and you run into someone. So don't be scared to just go out. People don't care if you don't know everything. You know what, Ms. Jones, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't have the, the answer to that. You know, I want to make sure that I give you the most up-to-date information, but I know a guy or I know a person. 
let me reach out to them and let me let me find out. And you shoot me a text. And hopefully I can get back to you immediately right then while you're still in the home. Um, that's why it's good that even if I can't take a call, if you text me and I know the answer off the top of my head with the details that you've given me, I'll respond right then, you know, guys, or within a few minutes typically, unless I'm tied up. And um, that way, because again, my only goal is for you to sound competent and confident, create opportunity and generate income revenue for yourself. That's my only focus. Gage, Gail, we good? I know this ran a lot of time. Uh, 